We can't call the fire that was a willful thing. Hundreds upon hundreds of films went up in flames, vanished in acrid nitrate smoke. Negatives from the days when Chicago was the golden city of motion pictures were lost forever. The bonfire raged on the back lot of the old s a studios in the year 1917. That was the year movies went west. But the old Chicago studios had spawned theaters that today use other films from other movie capitals. Everybody who was anybody was in Chicago films. Francis X. Bushman, Wallace Beery, Ben Turpin, Beverly Bain, Gloria Swanson, and Charlie. were treated as products, not valuable. Money makers, yes, but not valuable. Films for a week to be replaced by other films the following weeks. How do you reclaim that era, 1904 to 1917? You try to gather the pieces. Bill Buell, a Chicago filmmaker, came to the rescue. Years ago, a friend had given him a few of the old reels. Buell had never screened them. Hazel Buttemeyer could also make contributions. She had worked as a negative editor at the old s a studios on Argyle and sharpened her memory for us. Mm, They looked at the films that weren't too badly damaged. Some had to be rolled up and put away. The emulsion had separated from the base. Despite this, the fragments in the puzzle began to come together. In a modern editing studio, we were able to see what the old movies really looked like, played at their proper speed. The action was smooth, the professionalism apparent. They'd go out on the street, and if they would see anybody they thought they would like, they'd take them and say, well, do you want to work? They'd give them about two and a half day oh, for it, or pictures. <laughs> we were trying to gather film history. Hazel Buttemeyer had lived through it. All of us were trying to reclaim it. We were able to find an old bioscope camera patented in 1904 and used at the s a studio. It was owned by Mrs. Marvin Spoor, widow of the famous cameraman and director of photography, Major Spoor. She provided us with many pictures and memories of the old days at s a She told us of the friendship between her brother-in-law, George K. Spoor, founder of the s a Studios, and Dr. Preston Bradley, minister of the People's Church of Chicago. Les Cobley, now a stagehand at the Schubert Theater, was a prop man at s a back in the teens. And Shorty Richardson had been a cameraman at both the Seelig and s a studios. Barely in his teens, Shorty began to work in the movies as an assistant cameraman in the year 1906. These people could help us reclaim the era. We also poured over hundreds of old photographs, the heroes, the villains, the fair young maidens, the locations, the set. And we found a rare old 1914 film that gave us a bird's eye view of Chicago. The cameraman had taken to the air in a dirigible, throwing care to the four winds to film the city that lay below. Chicago in this era was characterized by Chaplin on one of his vaudeville jaunts through the city. He said Chicago had a fierce gaiety and yet underlying all was a masculine loneliness. It was a time, the proper time, for the rugged individual, for the big business hero, for dreams of might, wealth, power, for moralistic melodrama, for opportunity. It was around every corner, and the clouds were beginning to step off the stage and go around that corner into the movie.
On the northern fringes of the city, the William C. League and s and Studios furiously ground out comedies and melodramas. Because of the amount of light needed to expose the early films, many an indoor set was built outdoors. Directors were handed rolls of film and told to make them good. Hardly ever did a director repeat a scene unless he wanted to pay for the additional film himself. Time, even then, was money. Cowboys, Chicago had them, and many an early western was staged on the prairie flats of vacant lots. At California and Addison, the Selig Company erected some of its sets. Gordon Technical High School now stands there. The ghosts of early celluloid cowboys may still stalk through the corridors of the school. Phantoms in search of cameras no longer grinding. Near the drainage canal at Addison, dirt roads passed for streets in cardboard western towns. The Selig Studios were at Western Avenue and Irving Park Road. Some fragments of early films made here still exist. From 1904, the roller skate craze, later imitated by SNA with Ben Turpin. Cameras were pointed at anything on wheels. There was something inherently funny about mechanized man. A few falls, a few laughs, a few feet of film. Stories were often ad-libbed, on the spot. Cameramen went where the action was. Many of the scripts that were used in the production of the early, the early productions were similar to what they have today because they were written by people who had written novels and short stories, and the uh, directors were very versatile and very ingenious because they could take a simply worded script and make a production out of it that was filled with a lot, a lot of times surprises. Behind a high fenced lot on Irving Park Road at the William Seelig Studios, Rex Beach's novel, The Spoilers, was put on film. Directed by Colin Campbell, it was one of the most remarkable films of its day and is still considered a classic. In this early full-length feature film, realism was stressed. The plot is strong, so strong that it has been remade three times since into modern motion pictures. It's the story of a stalwart miner whose lady fair has been duped by villains. She thought them honest. In reality, they were taking over the gold claims of the innocent miners. Lannister, the upstanding hero, turns outlaw to fight the villains. It is the final smashing fight scene staged in the Irving Park studio that old timers remember. Fight to a Finish, featuring actors William Farnham in the role of the hero and Tom Sanchi playing the villain. No doubles were used. 
The actors fought with such relish that they felt their bruises for days afterward. Today, as cowboys are tossed gracefully through windows to come back for more well-planned violence, think of the fight in the spoilers. That's what a real fight looks like. Captions for the film were often lifted bodily from Beach's original prose. In fact, the film was so true to the novel that the author's words fit perfectly with the ending. Helen said, It was a noble thing you did today, my pagan. With which she came close to him, looking upward into his face, smiling yet withholding, while her eyes became two bottomless, boundless pools dark with love and brimming with the promise of his dreams. Argyle Street on Chicago's north side. The same buildings that once housed the old SNA studio. Today, they're the Wilding Studios, production headquarters for Bell and Howell. You can still see the double Indian heads, which were the SNA trademark. Under the Wilding sign is the old SNA name, the S standing for Spoor, the A for Anderson, who was also billed as Bronco Billy. Anderson was a director and actor, and he starred in over 400 westerns filmed at the SNA Studios on the West Coast. George K. Spoor, one of the true pioneers in the film industry, handled the Chicago end of the business. In 1894, Spoor met Edward H. Amott, inventor of the Magnoscope. Together, they manufactured short films for the early movie houses. Spoor ran the first big film rental exchange, which netted him an annual profit running into six figures. Then came his tie-up with G.M. Anderson, Bronco Billy, and the beginning of the successful SNA Studios in Chicago in 1907. The old SNA Studio was a very interesting place. I, I think it would be quite a contrast to the present day studios. You see them in Hollywood and London and Paris and Italy and around the world. It was a barn like affair, it, it covered almost a block, and they built the sets. Everybody was working. They might be taking a picture over in this corner and somebody building a barn and, and uh, uh, in the refinement, the technique of picture making in later years, they didn't know very much about, but uh, it, it was a fascinating place. It was a very busy place and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many films they made uh, a week. It's amazing. Luella Parsons, who was an early script editor, described her days at SNA. Miss Parsons remembered the great matinee idol Francis X. Bushman as SNA's pride and joy. But she said he was a pain in the neck because he had five lively children, a fact which everyone had to keep from the fans. Among the actors and technicians, young Wallace Beery was everybody's favorite. Spoor had discovered Beery as an elephant trainer and he hired him to act the role of a Swedish maid in the hilarious SNA Sweetie series. He used to have a sports car that we would ride around in. Wouldn't make any difference if there was a road there or not. He'd just go down the hills in Lincoln Park. He wouldn't care. One night he went through a big glass window on Michigan Boulevard. And uh, it was all fun for him. 
Dwayne Swanson, who has become one of our greatest and I think one of the finest actresses, got her start at SNA, and Wallace Beery took a liking to her, and the first thing you know, she was Mrs. Beery. Uh, Gloria Swanson and Wallace Beery were married in the lot of the old SNA. It was at that time, mostly all the trees in that vicinity was big, great big willow trees. And there was one on the lot as you go in on the driveway. And they were married under that tree. And now it is a parking lot. But before Beery and Swanson, there was Ben Turpin. He acted occasionally, but his main duties were in the property department. George Spoor noticed Turpin in the back lot clutching bouquets of flowers. He watched as Turpin climbed the wall of St. Boniface Cemetery and placed the flowers on a number of graves. Spoor was moved, but Turpin confessed that he was merely returning flowers that he had borrowed earlier to dress up a set. Years ago, in the theater and the studios, there was always a certain amount of superstition. Whistling in dressing rooms, putting your head on a bed, people that were cockeyed, that's what this Ben Turpin was, a cockeyed guy, you know. They wouldn't even let him on the lot out here first. But they finally put him into a picture, and that was the start of Ben Turpin out here. But he was funny. The company of actors at SNA, a few from the stage, some right out of school, like Gloria Swanson, one or two from the prop department, like Ben Turpin, and the biggest box office magnet of them all, Charlie Chaplin. Charlie signed a contract with SNA for $1,250 a week. Soon after coming to Chicago, he finished a film, his new job. Chaplin plays a movie struck zany who visits a casting office. Practically all of the backgrounds in the film are actual SNA studios. In the casting office is a young receptionist. You see her at the back desk, Miss Gloria Swanson. This is an early unbilled role for the future star. Equally movie-struck is Ben Turpin, and Chaplin cast as his foil. Needless to say, neither Chaplin nor Ben finds the road to acting either straight or narrow, and they're relegated to other jobs around the studio. Charlie first arrived in Chicago, he sought out and tested some of the SNA actors for this his first and only Chicago film. Gloria Swanson might have had more than a bit part in the film if she had not aspired to more lofty dramatic roles. When he tested Swanson, he had a terrible time trying to get a reaction out of her. Years later, Miss Swanson told him that because she hated slapstick, she had deliberately been uncooperative. Plot, of course, was a natural. After all, Chaplin's first job was to get out his first SNA film. 
Charlie put himself in the same shoes as those hopefuls who jammed the casting office at SNA. And he improvised from there, carefully polishing his routines, working out the seemingly effortless slapstick that was his mark of invention. <laughs> Humor in this film, as in earlier Chaplin pictures done at Keystone, bordered a trifle on the broad side rather than the pathos that he was later to develop in such West Coast SNA films as The Tramp. Here is Chaplin as the bad child adult directing himself toward the inflexible goal of stardom, wiping out the opposition, mopping up the floor with Ben Turpin and the other players. Chaplin grew restless for the West Coast climate, and he was anxious to get away from what he called the accountant mentality of the establishment. He grew more and more disdainful until he was finally permitted to join Bronco Billy Anderson at the SNA Studios in California. There, he made 13 more pictures, then left SNA for mutual. Spoor looked for Chaplin's replacement. His search took him to France, where he signed up one of the most popular comedians on the continent. Little Max Linder. When Chicago was Hollywood. 